Welcome to season four, episode 53 of the Jordan Peterson podcast. This is actually an episode that's from my podcast, but it was unbelievably good. I'm Michaela Peterson in case anyone listening is new. Don't worry, I didn't do much talking in this episode. It's mostly my dad and Africa Brooke. Africa is one of the most eloquent guests I've had on and her interaction with my dad was heart-wrenching. She wrote the viral article, Why I'm Leaving the Cult of Wokeness. Africa Brooks spoke about what made her write that article and the effects it had on her life afterwards, and Dad wanted to put the episode up on his channel because it was so good. We ended up discussing wokeness, politics, religion, racism. This is not an episode to miss. The video version is available on my channel on YouTube. That's youtube.com slash Michaela Peterson videos, but typing in Jordan Peterson Africa Brooke will do. There are also clips of the really good parts available on Dad's channel. I hope you enjoy this episode. It's really worth a listen. Also, starting now, we're going to be releasing an interview podcast on Mondays on Dad's channel, and every Thursday we'll be releasing another podcast, possibly a compilation podcast. Dad's going on tour, so releasing two new interviews per week isn't going to be possible. I'll be joining him on tour, which is so exciting, starting in January. I hope to see some of you guys out there. I hope you enjoy this episode, and remember, if you do want the video version, it's available on YouTube. Have a wonderful week. Africa Brooke, welcome to my podcast. Thank you. I'm I'm so thrilled that we're able to do this, and I think the timing is perfect, actually, because I know we've tried to do it a few times before, um, but there's something about this time specifically, just the timing of this, that feels... That feels very, very aligned. So I'm very, very happy to be here with both of you. Thank you. Maybe we had to cancel a few times because my dad had to join. Who knows? Right? I I think so. I think that might have been it. (laughs) Okay. Before we get started, um, one, I want to read a paragraph from the article you wrote that went viral. uh, And then I'm going to get you to introduce yourself and then we can get started. So this is... This is why I'm leaving the cult of wokeness. I can no longer be an active participant in any culture or movement that encourages groupthink, outrage on demand, fear and violence, revamped segregation, fabricating history, cancellations masked as accountability, self-centeredness, normalization of racism towards white people, the disempowerment of black people masked as social justice, the constant redefining of existing language, ignoring self-responsibility, constant pathologizing, oppressed versus oppressor mentality, and the preference... I almost did the entire thing with no errors. And the pressure to conform and comply. It's exhausting, and honestly, I have better things to do with my time, not to mention it's killing us. Okay. Now you can do your intro. (laughs) So my name is Africa Brooke and I am a writer, I'm a consultant, and I'm also a speaker. There are many other things that I do, but that's the best way to kind of encapsulate everything. So my journey into the work that I do now, which is specifically focusing on the costs and the effects of self-sabotage and self-censorship, began about five years ago. Um, We can go into this later or I can kind of just give a little bit of a brief um, a brief summary now, um, it became five, it, it began five years ago when I got sober. And me getting sober wasn't just a decision that I made overnight. And then now I have five years of sobriety. It was actually a very grueling, soul-destroying process. And I had relapsed seven times before that, between the ages of 19 to 24. And I always say that what was different about that final time in 2016 when I was just so physically exhausted with that cycle is that I became curious about what that cycle actually was. I started to get curious about human behavior, about the concept of self-sabotage, which is something that I discovered just through researching, wanting to understand my own behavior. And it's it, it's what leads me to the work that I do now where I ended up looking at my own subjective experience, but it ended up speaking to hundreds, now thousands of people, um, speaking to academics, speaking to people that were addicts, speaking to people in my family who also experienced addiction. And it slowly started to become something that felt like a responsibility for me to give people this information. And now I don't just focus on the self, the individual. I now look at self-sabotage and self-censorship 
through the lens of the collective, which is where my letter comes from, and it, uh, and it kind of speaks to that. Okay, so when is this letter from and how many people have read this? Hmm. This letter was published on January the 2nd, 2021. And I had been writing it for about six months, but, you know, two years in the making, if you will. But when I published it, it was only to a very small newsletter of my maybe 2000 people. And it just, it, it just took off. And by month six, it had been read by 3.5 million people. And I mean, it's it's not a short letter. It's 4,000 words, which for anyone to have read even half of that in, in the time that we're in right now, where people prefer anything that is short and quick, um, it really tells me something. And now it's been read by over 4 million people. Wow. Hmm. Okay. So before you, you wrote this, you said, why I'm leaving the cult of wokeness. So what were your beliefs prior to the publication of this letter and how have they changed? That's a good question. Let me just sit with that for a second. What were my beliefs prior to this letter? I wouldn't even be able to sort of list them in a very neat way. Um, because I thought I was a very balanced person. I had never over-identified with any kind of movement. I had never um, seen myself as a firm part of social justice, if you will. I, I had friends that were part of those movements, et cetera, but I had never seen myself in that way. But the thing is, you don't often realize just how much a label is impacting you until you see yourself act in a way that you wouldn't expect. So in terms of beliefs, for example, I didn't believe that all white people were racist, even though this was common rhetoric that I was hearing and to the point where it was just kind of normal and expected for me to hear people say things like that, you know, but then in my mind, I would say, okay, they don't actually mean every white person. They're just talking about the system of whiteness, et cetera, et cetera. So I had been in certain spaces long enough to kind of understand what people quote unquote really do mean. Um, so it's not as if I thought in that way, but for me, the fact that it was even normal for me to hear things like that is what started to make me a little bit uncomfortable. Um, my beliefs were still very much what they are now, but I think the issue was that I was afraid to actually voice what my true values were. I was afraid that if I say, actually, no, I don't agree with that person who's on the left, and I actually very much agree with that person who is on, quote unquote, the right, that I shouldn't be thinking that way, that it was, I was betraying the movement in some kind of way, you know, that because I'm black, because I'm women, because et cetera, et cetera, I shouldn't be thinking in this way. So I would say my beliefs weren't really different from what they are now, but I was holding back from actually expressing my true values and my truest thoughts. How did you, how do you think you found what your true values and your true thoughts were? And, and how did you come to the realization mm -hmm. that you weren't, you know, that you were implicitly participating in something akin to self-censorship? Yes. You know, I think it's when I realized that I was crossing my own boundaries. That's when I was reminded of what my true values were, because I value honesty, even when it's uncomfortable. And that's something that I've always spoken about publicly in, in, in many different ways and talking about other things. But essentially, I, I believe in honesty, even when it's deeply uncomfortable. But I wasn't being honest myself. Maybe behind closed doors, I was. Maybe behind closed doors, I was listening to thinkers like yourself, Jordan, who I had been told that I shouldn't listen to you. Uh, because of, you know, certain identity markers, like the ones I've mentioned, Black, women, etc. Um, so it's when I realized that I was crossing my own boundaries, and it was actually making me quite sick, because I think for many people, many people might resonate, but when you suppress something long enough, it has to go somewhere. So if you, if you just hold it and hold it and hold it, you can get physically sick. And migraines are something that I've been guessing since I was about 11, actually. And from about 2019 or throughout 2020 last year, I was getting severe migraines. And this was when I was internally battling with just censoring myself and feeling like it's wrong for me to think these things, let alone express them publicly. 
Um, so I would say that I, I was reminded of what my values were when I realized that I had been crossing my boundaries. Okay, so for such I, a I got time. a cu- couple of questions about that. So if yeah. I got your story right so far, so you, 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 you said that you had more or less implicitly and perhaps somewhat explicitly accepted a version of yourself that was in alignment with with group identity categorizations. You said, well, yes. I'm black, I'm a woman, I'm young. Um, so I have to, so the proper set of opinions for me to have and express is this set. Mm-hmm. And then you noticed that you felt or thought at least some things that were in contradiction to that. And then you noticed yes. that you were afraid to express those. And then yes. you started to realize that perhaps the fact that you weren't allowed to express those or to explore them was associated with, well, with stress at least, and and then with whatever the contribution of the stress might be to your vulnerability. So exacerbating Mm -hmm. your, so, and then, so was it, and then did your explicit, your new explicit beliefs start to, to develop as a consequence of that? And and what changed for, for you? What changed for me was a very, was a very, very, very specific uh, moment that I mentioned in my letter as well. It was last year when I would say this was May, May or June, um, when you know the racial uprising in the U.S. was happening. George Floyd, um, his story, the story of his killing, spread all across the world essentially, and this was a time where. I found myself feeling extremely challenged. I I found myself feeling the pressure to perform in a way that was identical to other black people, that I wasn't allowed to actually sit back and say, wait, what what actually happened? What What is the story? There was a very specific story that I was supposed to take on board and I was supposed to outwardly. What was that story that you were supposed to take on board exactly? Right. So the story specifically that I felt I needed to take on board was that black people were being hunted down in the U.S. And that racial divide, um, the current racial divide that we're seeing in the U.S. And bear in mind, I don't live in the U.S. I'm in I'm in London. I'm in the U.K. I've never been to the U.S. my entire life. I'm not uh, I, I wouldn't be able to tell you the ins and outs of, of the politics of America. Um Black people are being hunted down. And as a black person, it is your responsibility to speak against white supremacy. It is your responsibility to turn to every single white person in your life and ask them why they are not speaking about this very specific situation in the US. So it was it was along those lines, but it wasn't just happening online. It was also happening offline. Um, And I felt this pressure. And you know what? I'll be very honest. I. At the same time as me feeling that pressure, I felt a deep sense of connection to people that looks like me. It was a very emotional time. I felt like we were all coming together and there's this sort of unity that I had never experienced before. Yes, there was a lot of anger, a lot of frustration, and I think both can be very essential ingredients depending on the context. Um, But soon after that, I started to feel uncomfortable because there seemed like there was there wasn't any room for questioning. You just had to follow what you were being told to do. You just had to play along to the script. And if you were white, you were supposed to um, apologize for all the sins of your ancestors and the sins that you were going to commit yourself in future because you're white, right? So do you start to wonder then maybe mm. that, that the point of the moral outrage is to encourage the following that you were finding psychologically objectionable rather than to redress the hypothetical social wrongs that were being uh, that are, that are right. being manifested is that right yes that's that's exactly it that's exactly it and the specific incident that i'm talking about here was born from that so my following was pretty big at that time i would say 50,000 or so which is still a lot of people and I was resharing a lot of um, posts that other people were sharing as well uh, about why it's important, especially if you're white, to speak up at this time, et cetera, et cetera. And what's interesting about this is that I've never been someone that will just instantly share something or say something because I feel that I should, which is why when Michaela, you asked before, what were your beliefs? I 
I could easily say that I feel like I've always believed the same things, but it's about what, what I was actually expressing outwardly, right? Um, so I was sharing a lot of things because of the emotions that I felt because of the narrative that as a Black person, this is your opportunity to stand for something, you know, um, resharing a lot of things. And there was a man who sent me a message, and this wasn't an, an unkind message or anything like that. When I look at it now in retrospect, he was just asking if everything that I'm sharing and everything that I'm saying right now um, is the best approach to take. I, I believe this was a man who was familiar with my work before, so he he felt as if there was something out of character. So he asked me if this was the best approach to take. This was a private message. And instantly, it didn't even cross my mind to have a conversation with him privately. My instant thought, which is a thought I had never in my entire life had before, was how dare you question a Black woman in that way? That was my that was my first thought. I've never I've never thought in that way before. I'm open to having conversations, difficult conversations. I've been doing it for years. But in that moment, because there was just such a perfect environment that had been created, that was my first thought. So I screenshotted that message and I posted it onto my feed to my audience for all to see. Um, and of course, I got exactly what I needed in that moment. I got exactly what my ego was looking for. Thousands of people uh, telling me that this man was wrong. Uh, people telling me that I shouldn't have to educate anyone. You know, that's mm -hmm. kind of the common social justice mm -hmm. language. No one is here to educate you, especially. Mm -hmm. Or to do unpaid they, emotional labor. Right. Mm -hmm. There we go. Emotional mm -hmm. labor, especially because I fall under certain identity markers, which are seen as more important than others. You know, a black woman shouldn't have to educate you. So that was about 20 minutes, 20 very, very long minutes and thousands of people sort of swarming. It, it was a very, very visceral and the validation and affirmation that I felt in that moment was like nothing I, I had experienced in a while. And it was almost like an out of body experience. And maybe someone else hearing this might think, well, it's, it's just a fucking Instagram post. But I was seeing myself in a way that I had never seen myself before. It's almost like I was hovering over myself, holding my phone, seeing a flood of this validation coming in. So I publicly shamed this man who had simply mm -hmm. just asked a question, mm -hmm. you know, um, and I didn't I didn't even have to deal with him. It. It, it's not. A, it, and it's really important for me to talk about these things in a very um, in a very open and honest way. But in that moment, I, I dehumanized him. He wasn't he wasn't a human being. He was just that's just a question that I received. And I didn't have to process it. Ask myself, why do I feel uncomfortable? Is this man, is this person not owed some kind of response or not at all? He messaged me in a private place. Should I not give him the respect of doing the same? No, I didn't. Um, so within that 20 minutes, I think about six to 7,000 people commented or liked this post and something just felt as, as, you know, with the same intensity that it felt validating and affirming, I just felt sick. <laughs> it, it, was, it was just like that, as if, I, I had snapped out of something and I know what that something was because obviously now I know I had been, you know, almost ideologically possessed and I had no idea, you know. Um, yeah, and what an appeal to narcissism you have. Gosh, eh? It's stunning. Right? It's, it's an, I'm amazed that you, it's so interesting that you experienced that in all its potency, right? Yes. The elevation of your opinion to unquestionable, the social validation Gosh. of that, extraordinarily powerful and tempting. And right. then to notice that it actually made you sick. That's right. really something. Right. That is, that's really impressive. Yeah. I don't think people are built for the level that social media can give you at the moment, like mm -hmm. 6,000 or 7,000 people all agreeing with you. It's really hard to psychologically overcome that. Right. In, in 20 minutes, in 20 yeah. minutes, which on social media, is, it's, it's two minutes. If you're sitting there and you're holding your phone and because I'm a very visual person, sometimes I picture this being surrounded by that amount of people who are telling you that you've done a great job. That man, he was wrong. He shouldn't have spoken to you in that way. 
that speaks to a part of me that needs that, a part of me that needs that in a way that is completely unrelated to what was actually happening in that moment. But that moment that I felt sick, I just felt like, Africa, what are you, what are you doing? What, what are you actually doing? And I removed the post. Um, and what, what were you doing? What were you actually doing? Gosh. This episode is brought to you by Basis. If you've been listening to the podcast, you've heard me talk about Elysium Health and their flagship product, Basis, an NAD supplement. Elysium has some of the world's best scientists working on products to offset the effects of aging. As we get older, for example, we all experience a gradual loss of brain matter. Elysium supplement Matter is patented and clinically proven to slow that loss down in the brain's memory centers by an average of 86%. As a result, many Matter customers have reported improvements in memory and cognition, although results may vary, of course. Elysium's unlike any other health company I know. It was created in partnership with Oxford, and they have their own patented supplements. Dozens of the world's best scientists work for Elysium, eight of which are Nobel Prize winners. It was founded by famous MIT researcher Dr. Leonard Grante, an expert on the science of aging and director of the Glenn Center for Biology of Aging Research at MIT. We all want to keep our brain at peak function for as long as possible. And if we invest in our bodies, which we should be doing, cough, diet, cough, why not invest in our brain's health too? Elysium now has a special offer for JBP listeners. You just go to explorematter.com slash Jordan and enter code JBP10 at checkout to save 10% off prepaid plans for Matter or their other supplements. Try Matter or Basis today and keep doing what you love for as long as you can. That's explorematter.com slash Jordan using code JBP10 at checkout. I hope you guys enjoy the rest of the episode. What do you think it was that made you sick? Mm. I was performing. I was performing. I was performing. And I know performance very, very well. Having have gone through what I did with alcohol and my my father, when we were growing up, he was also an alcoholic. We grew up in a very, very abusive home. He was physically abusive. And which is where self-censorship actually came from for me from a very young age. Because when you're in such an uncertain environment, you, you learn how to navigate it pretty quickly. You learn how to censor yourself so that you can stay safe. Um, so I learned how to perform from a very, very young age, to perform whatever version is going gonna, is gonna to make him happy, whatever version is going to make him less likely to hit me or my siblings or my mom. And in that moment, and I've only said this out loud maybe twice, but in that moment with that man, that kind of awakening, uh, that very rude awakening, I felt like I was performing the version of myself that would stop me from getting hit or mobbed by the public. This episode is brought to you by Super Speciosa. Super Speciosa is a Kratom company. Kratom is a herb related to the coffee plant, the leaves or extracts from the leaves have been used as a stimulant and a sedative. It works on opiate receptors in the brain, so it's been used to treat chronic pain, digestive ailments, and aid in withdrawal from opiate dependency. I always advocate for dietary changes to enhance mood and improve your life before anything else. Diet, exercise, infrared saunas, mainly avoiding inflammatory foods, but if you're still having trouble and you've already tried other things, Kratom might help you. Kratom's great for energy support. Some people will use it as a pre-workout, a substitute for coffee. Some people use it to manage stress and to help them relax. Super Speciosa has different strains. Some help you relax, some give you energy. Super Speciosa's Kratom is reliable, third-party lab tested and approved under the American Kratom Association's Quality Standards Program. Some of their products, the ones I use, have only natural Kratom and no other ingredients. Remember, because this works on opiate receptors, it can cause addiction if you overdo it. So do your research, Google everything you take or DuckDuckGo everything you take. Be super paranoid and know what you put into your body. I've been someone who's come off of opiates multiple times from surgeries, and I wish I'd known about something like this during those lovely periods of time. If you want to try some Kratom and get 20% off, go to getsuperleaf.com mp and enter code MP for 20% off. That's getsuperleaf.com slash MP 
promo code MP for 20% off. I hope you guys enjoy the rest of the episode. So you removed the post and then yeah. what happened afterwards? What, where did this go? I removed the post and I just retracted internally. But externally, I just removed the post and I pretended that it had never happened. A lot of my the work that I do is public. A lot of the conversations I have are public. So I kind of just continued. But behind the scenes, this is when I started to really want to understand exactly what had happened in that moment. What had I been experiencing for the past two years? Um, and that's when my letter started taking shape. And my letter was just a journal entry to begin with, just writing it to myself so that I could, I could say that I'm done. I, I don't want to play this game anymore. Um, this game is not just making me sick, but it's making all of us sick. Um, and writing has always been the way that I'm able to really make sense of how I feel without feeling like I need to necessarily express it vocally. And... I, I would say that's what really saved me from slipping into shame because everything that had happened with that man, it, it was a, it could have been very easy to shame myself or to either just pretend it never happened, which is something that I see a lot actually. Um, just denial, just the theme of denial runs through everything that I'm seeing play out in the culture. It, I see things like that all the time where someone will publicly shame someone or they will misrepresent someone and then maybe find out that they were wrong in a very public way as well. And then they'll just pretend that it never happened, you know, and they get to move on. But that person, do they get to move on? You know, when I think of that man who I have reached out to since, um, he doesn't necessarily get to move on in the same way I did, because if I've shared his handle, maybe there's someone that has me on such a pedestal that they feel that Africa shouldn't have had to go through this so I'm going to you know I I don't know make sure that this man pays or it happens all the time it happens all the time right um so behind the scenes that's when I started writing this letter do you have I'm sure that this is going to resonate with people this conversation mm -hmm. um do you have suggestions for people who might be feeling that kind of like I know what you mean when you do something that you're like your soul doesn't agree with. And it's like, I call it, I think what I get is some sort of existential horror. Oh, and it's just like, yeah. it's just like everywhere. And it's like, you're going in the wrong direction of reality or something. So if, if people are stuck in that and are scared, how, how do those people try and stop and switch to going in the right direction. Hopefully that made it some semblance of sense. Right, right. And you know what, Michaela, I wish there was a, you can imagine that I get asked that question hundreds yeah. of times a day. And I think we want a simple answer, don't we? We we want just one answer that, I I don't think there's one answer. Um, Part of it is to, mm. to try to listen to what you say, to what you're saying and, see if it makes you feel stronger or weaker. Yeah. Like each word is like a stepping stone through a swamp. Right. You know, and, and if it's the right word, then you step on it and it feels secure and stable compared to the territory around it. And you test that out and then you dare to see if that's the way you think as opposed to that persona yeah. that you're putting on for public adulation and protection, mm -hmm. right? That's the temptation of the actor. So in, in the movie Pinocchio, when Pinocchio is trying to stop lying and to become a real boy, he faces two major temptations apart from lying. One is to be a victim. And the other is to be an actor. Mm. It took me a long time to, to figure out why being an actor was a temptation. But Gosh. you put your finger on it with your description. It's to adopt a set of roles that will well, appeal to narcissistic inflation, something like that. It's, it's, right. and there's a terrible totalitarian danger in that. It's terrible. Yes. So, yes. And, and that's my suspicions are that's what you were reacting to so viscerally that you were participating in that. And you had your reasons, but 
Um, you mentioned something that I think maybe the three of us could discuss that would be would be interesting. You know, this idea about all white people being racist. So, mm. so I kind of wondered about that as a psychologist, but more broadly, because maybe you could say, well, are all people racist? And here's, here's what I mean by that. Well, we all have an in-group preference. Now, what that group might be, you know, it might be you and the person you love, it might be you and your family, it might be you and your town, it might be you and your state or your country, it might be you and your race. You know, that, that who that in-group is can vary. Mm -hmm. But we do have preferences for people and we do have in-group preferences. And the corollary of that is that we have out-group uh, skepticism and maybe fear and maybe disgust and all of that. And from what I've been able to understand anthropologically, that's more or less a human universal. You know, as, mm -hmm. as different peoples have been brought around the world into global community, let's say, one of the things that anthropologists have found is that it's, it's almost always the case that any given tribe of people will use the word that refers to human beings to their tribe and some other word to everyone else. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And so it's possible that that's a deep tendency that we all have to fight against. And I mean, there's part of the reason these ideas are so compelling to people and able to possess them, the, the wokeness ideas, let's say, to use a mm -hmm. casual category, is that you know, they contain an element of truth. You know, people have an in-group preference. That can easily be distorted into something that's, that's quite akin to racism. I mean, you even see that in chimpanzees, for example. They'll go on raiding forays into neighboring territories and if they outnumber, the males do this, if they outnumber the f foreigners that they come across, they will tear them to pieces. So it's, yeah, yeah, that was a stunning discovery. Lovely. That, lovely that primatologists made. Jane Goodall's team f discovered that in the 70s. It was a real shock. Yeah. Right. So They were trying to find all the nice chimps. Yeah, well, they're like, oh, they just rip each other down there to shreds. Whoa, okay. Yeah, exactly. Well, no one had had any inkling previous to that, that that human tendency for, for war, you mm. know, broadly speaking, was so deep that it was even shared by our, you know, closest animal uh, um, relative. So mm. this is very deep. So, you know, the idea that racism and in-group preference, all of that is something that human beings struggle with is true. And then you say, well, you know, you twist that a bit and you say, well, that's particularly true of white people because they hold the power. It's like, well, you know, it's an interesting proposition, but the question is, well, if it's true exactly how it's tr how is it true and what's its limits and, you know, how does that play out in the case of other races or groups, Asians, for example, right. um, um, and what are the dangers of putting the idea that way? Like, and what makes you so sure that that's also not true of your group and mm -hmm. how does power play into that like these are all these are all genuine questions that we should be asking right. ourselves instead of like hammering home the idea that we have the answer to this it's like how well, all you know you, you 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 said you know you you got elevated as a black woman mm. in, in this well it's very difficult to see that to not see that as an exacerbation of your in-group preference and then an exaggeration of that implicit or explicit racism on your part. And I think that's part of what you were rebelling against. Yes, 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 yes. Oh, and, and you know what? The questions that you were just asking before, those are the exact questions that I had, just simple mm -hmm. questions. Um, and it started to signal again that something wasn't right here, that I couldn't even just ask the simplest questions or at least felt that I couldn't. I could have, but I was much more scared of the consequences of asking the questions than leading mm -hmm. with the curiosity of getting some kind of answer, right? Um, and in my letter, Michaela, you read this part out earlier about the disempowerment of Black people. That's how I started to feel, extremely disempowered. You know, even when people would say things like, yeah, it's because white people have all the power, 
according to who and in what context are we talking mm-hmm. about? Does so it, which, does it matter which white where people? in the world you are? Mm-hmm. Which ones? Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? I had, I had an experience like that. Um, it, it not exactly like that. It was yeah. like that, but for me, and I was taking sciences um, because I'd switched out of humanities because there was a lot of, you know, I was taking a course on Homer and it was Homer through the feminist lens. And I was like, that's not what I came. That's not what I paid you guys for. So I s- switched into sciences and about every couple of months, somebody would come in and they'd say, OK, for all the women in the room, I know you've had you've had a much harder time getting to where you are than the men have. And I, I was just like, are you are you telling me I'm stupid? Mm. Like, what exactly are you saying here? And how dare you suggest that it was just it was like insulting in kind of a condescending right. way, which was the complete opposite of whatever they were. Well, it, maybe it wasn't the opposite of what they were trying to do. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's condescending and irritating. Yeah, well, it, yeah. Makes, me. it may, Well, think about what that does in some sense. It makes your generic femininity and your mm. generic vulnerability far more important uh, than your individual right. particularity. Yeah. You know, and this is what I've been objecting to with regards to this group mentality from the beginning. It's it, it seems to me that it's fundamental danger. The fundamental mm. danger is the devaluation of the of the sacredness of the individual as the primary category. You replace that by group identity. You have no idea what kind of devil you're messing with. Or, mm. or, or maybe you do to some degree. You experienced it a bit because you messed about with that devil. And you got yes. tempted and 7,000 people told you you were right. Mm-hmm, it's like, imagine yeah. you're a political leader. Okay, now imagine 30 million people tell you that you're right and they chant that in a mob. And they do that everywhere you go. Yeah, that's what happened in Germany. Mm. And then you play to the crowd. You, you're that actor. You play to the crowd. And you get hungrier and hungrier for that validation. And you train yourself to say anything the crowd demands, no matter how dark. Right. 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 And I I find it extremely worrying, which is why I speak very, very loudly in the way that I do, especially online, because that's exactly what we're starting to see online. People saying whatever it takes to get that same level of validation and affirmation every single time. And when we go back to the question that you asked earlier of what did you then do after you removed that post, there were also other things that I did um, behind the scenes, which is where you come in again, Jordan. I thought to myself, okay, so who were some of the people that I discarded in the past because I was told to, not because it was a conscious decision that I made on my part. What was I told that I shouldn't read that I shouldn't agree with that I shouldn't listen to um and I specifically started started listening to speakers I I would say actually this was more so after that specific incident online but I had started doing this from late 2019 just challenging myself to sit through conversations being had by people I would never have listened to people that are let's say on quote-unquote the right which is interesting because I've never identified as being part on the left it, it's assumed it's assumed because <laughs> because of all of those identity markers and the things that I might agree with mostly the things that I'm most aware of it's just assumed to the point where maybe I started to assume that mm-hmm. about myself mm-hmm. which is why I had resistance to the right um no Michaela go 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 no no I I just liked your <laughs> That that was all. That was all. You go ahead. (laughs) But it's um, and and also there's a cultural aspect to this. So I was born and raised in Zimbabwe. That's that's where I'm from. That's home. That's still the first language that I speak at home with my family. Um, And I left there at the age of nine. I'm 20. I'm 29 now. And over identifying with a political party is just not really culturally a thing. No one even says things, you know, like they're on the left or the right or they're Zanupia for MDC. Those are the political parties, but they're not. Um, it's something that I I see more of in the West, if you will, like a you know on dating apps, people will have left leftist or lefty or things <laughs> things like that. They've become markers of religious affiliation. Mm-hmm. 
Yes, and that's also a terrible thing because mm. when politics becomes religion, it, it's gone too far. And that's part of the danger of the loss of religion is that mm. you don't, you can't get rid of it. It crops up somewhere. Something else gets inflated into religious dimensions. And that's yes. when Paul, and that's when, when things are, you're supposed to render unto Caesar what are Caesar's and render unto God what are God's, what is God's. Mm. And if you render unto Caesar... I just Caesar, read that yesterday. Yeah, great, great. That's weird. Mm. Mm. That's weird. Mm. Okay. Really? And if you render... Yeah, really. If you weird. render unto God, if you render unto Caesar what is God's, then Caesar gets inflated into a God. Mm. And, and, and that's another danger and an existential danger for everyone. Like we, we, we have this rational idea that we can dispense with our religious values. But by definition, our religious values are our deepest values. Mm -hmm. By definition. And you have to have deep values or you're disintegrated and aimless. And they're going to come from somewhere and be placed somewhere. And if they slip out of a, a, a domain of religion that's set aside specially for that, then it's easy for the political to become inflated. And, right. and that's, it's, we don't want that. That's, that's, that's not good. Right. So, yeah. Okay. So that's not happening in Zimbabwe. So, no. and, and you see it here. <laughs> oh, I see it. Oh, I see it. Um, so what I, what I decided to do was to just listen to different people. And I remember listening to some of your, some of your lectures, Jordan, I wouldn't be able to tell you which, which one specifically, because I listened to so many, but in the beginning, and this was still happening last summer as well. I was sitting there just watching alone. And I remember even for a few months feeling like I'm doing something wrong. And oh, this was You probably such were. A... You probably were. <laughs> <laughs> and this was such a bizarre feeling mm -hmm. because, again, maybe I would have experienced this differently if I had firmly identified with being on, quote unquote, the left or being a feminist, I've never identified in that way, or just any of these things that would kind of make sense for me to fully physically reject what I'm watching right now. But I had always considered myself to be quite, quite balanced, right? But it took me sitting down, listening to you amongst other people to really realize just how sucked into these echo chambers I had been, because I felt as though I was betraying the movement in some kind of way and you know what's so interesting when i say the movement i wouldn't be able to tell you which one any pick pick any that i'm betraying some kind of bigger collective purpose why did you be why did you continue why did you do it why did you continue and how did you know that that voice mm. wasn't the true voice of your conscience mm. yeah that's a good question uh, that's a good question I knew it because that the discomfort that I felt wasn't anything compared to the sickness that I had felt for the past two years, actually mm. being immersed in those spaces. And more than that, everything that not only you were saying and that other thinkers were saying, I remember listening to Larry Elder, for example, um, and feeling the very same things, if not more, because I was receiving certain information from a black man and I'd never heard anyone speak in that kind of way before in a very objective way talking about certain data as to why maybe he doesn't think there's systemic racism in the U.S. etc cetera, etc cetera. just data-driven research and I, I still felt that I couldn't it the cognitive dissonance to just put it very mm -hmm. simply the mm -hmm. cognitive dissonance was intense but I sat with it because I'm very familiar with discomfort I always see my sobriety and the journey to getting sober as the foundation that holds me in place when I'm feeling any kind of discomfort. Because I, when I go back to getting sober, for example, that final eighth time, I felt, I felt so uncomfortable. It, there was nothing in that moment, there was nothing empowering about it. It wasn't this profound decision that I made and that and now I live a sober life. It was, I had no other choice. Otherwise, I was going to be sick for the rest of my life. Yeah, I think you make, I, you make a choice like that, not in pride, but in abject humility. Yes. 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 And I see that process that I took myself through um, 
of kind of giving myself back to myself is the way that I think of it, you know, sitting through those lectures, hearing you talk, um, because I had had an experience in relation to you years before where I had made a firm decision that I would never in my life (laughs) listen to anything this man has to say. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Based on a three minute clip, mind you. (laughs) Do you remember what it was that I said that was so profoundly irritating? I mean, oh, I there's do many. There's, can you tell me what? Can you tell me what that was? <laughs> of course, you were talking about the gender pay gap, um, mm. and this was a this was part of a longer interview. The you know the interview that you had with Kevin Newman, and this was a clip, three minute clip. You were talking about the gender pay gap, and you were saying that you know, paraphrasing here, but that the reason for most women is because most women are agreeable most women don't negotiate etc cetera, etc cetera. I, I believe that was essentially essentially giving people options as to why it could be that there's this thing that exists or doesn't exist and I didn't even finish the clip I didn't even finish the three minute clip but based on the things that another out of context clip that I had seen before And the way that I'd heard your name being spoken of before in in the context of the trans conversation that that was happening around that time, 2018. Right, exactly. Um, Again, I was watching this clip and it's almost like I wasn't even listening to what you were saying. I had already decided that I, I, I don't like this man because someone that I trust has told me that I shouldn't like him. So therefore, you know, the decision is made. Why do I even have to finish that video? Right, of course. And it was just, right? Mm -hmm. And it was just normal. Well, you know, we use heuristics like that all the time, you know, and and it's easy to get caught up in them because, well, you can't listen to everyone. And so you kind of have to make a snap judgment about almost Mm. everyone. And and the default is you don't listen because there's like 7 billion people. So obviously you're not (laughs) listening to most of them. So you don't need much of an excuse. And, it, right. and it's really easy for that to get. And I mean, it's not like I haven't experienced that. Like, you know, yeah. on my podcast, you know, I invite people on Abigail Schreier, for example. She wrote, uh, I don't remember oh, the, yes. the, 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 her, the name of her most recent book, but it's a investigation into the downside of the of the rush to make everything gender fluid, essentially. Mm. And I was terrified when when I had her on. I mean, I was in rather irreversible health, damage. Irreversible damage. Yeah. That's and, the one. you know, I want to have Andy No on my podcast, but that also makes me nervous, too. And, you know, because yes. he's tarred with the fascist brush. And and then you get it's guilt by association. And that might have been mm-hmm. part of what you were feeling. So uh, those, so you think, well, you need a simplifying heuristic. And part of that is, well, he, that most people aren't worth listening to. And he's definitely not worth listening to. And, right. and, and then that can so easily become politicized. And once it is, especially when the political has become religious, it's really, really hard to overcome that. Yeah, and so, it really is. You know, a lot of the things that the radical left are pointing out are in some sense universal human failings. And so they have that truth about them. I mean, because we could ask ourselves, um, given the implicit tendency for human beings to have a pronounced in-group preference and the potential we have for violence against out-group members, how do we all address our proclivity to damn the foreigner? Okay, that's a really important question. Mm. And I then, feel like I've got a good, I've got a good answer. Okay, let, let me add this the one, my, the one end of, to that. And then the next thing okay. is, well, w- we all have these proclivities. How are they exacerbated by, by power and privilege? Right. Those are good questions. But as soon as we make it instantly racist, well, then we can't even yes. ask the damn questions properly anymore. So Mick, sorry. My joke is over now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I stomped all over your timely joke. You stomped all over my tiny little joke. Uh, I was thinking about that question earlier, though. Uh, if everyone has these tendencies, which they certainly do, I've noticed that if I have a guest on my podcast, and I, I think my audience is fairly open-minded, but then I'll have a guest on that, and they'll hate them. Mm-hmm. And I'll be like, well, you can't just... Even if you don't agree with them, maybe and maybe they are wrong, but like you can't just cancel people because they don't agree with you because you're doing exactly the same thing that the people you're complaining about. Well, you know, and also maybe you're 
maybe your stupid opinions aren't right. They're probably not yeah. right. And like, are you so sure your life is going so much the way you want it to go? And you're such a bloody paragon of virtue and the light is shining out every orifice that everything right. you think and say is correct. And everyone who disabuses you of your notions is evil. You're really so right. sure of that, are you? So, you right. know, you wander around and you think, God, maybe I should listen to this person because I'm such an ignorant bastard and I'm so full of malevolence <laughs> and maybe they'll drop one thing on me that won't make me like miserable and doomed to hell and to drag everyone yes. else there too. That's, yes. yeah, well. You know, I, I, I felt something similar when, when I finally leaned into listening to you properly because what was interesting, even after that moment in 2018, watching that three minute clip, deciding, this man is evil. I want nothing to do with him ever again. And of course, I didn't think I would ever have anything to do with him. Yeah, look what happened. Ha-ha. <laughs> <laughs> Infiltrated, me, yeah. Right? Um, people in my, especially people that were not really connected to the digital world, a lot of my, uh, a lot of older men in my life, for example, and women in my life would always tell me to read your book. It's Honestly, I, people would always say to me, Africa, you will really love this book. I would have friends of mine send me lectures. I think you're really going to like this. And I, I would just completely ignore it. And in my mind, I'd be thinking, what am I, what am I going to find? What am I supposed to like? Because again, I have this idea of you built up in my head. So I'm finding it very confusing that people that know me very well are telling me that there's something that I'm going to like, right? Yeah, what the Very hell? confusing. But again, for years, what the hell? For years, I ignored it. So when I started watching your lectures late 2019 and last summer as well, in the beginning, I could notice myself listening to you and finding, waiting for a moment where I could say, aha, mm -hmm, see? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. See? Right. I, I, I knew I was right. And you know what? I waited. I wait, that moment never came. That moment okay. never came. That and comes that for also, me right? all the time. <laughs> really. <laughs> and that again, so it, it's like there wasn't one moment of being awake and then it's done. So many little, tiny, seemingly insignificant moments where I'm just sitting here by my sofa, just watching and listening, observing myself, waiting, you know, for that confirmation that I'm right. Mm -hmm. And then it never coming. And then I have mm -hmm. to deal with that. And then, I, so again, my curiosity, I finally allowed myself to be curious again. And now, Jordan, I can say you have been one of the most influential people to me for so many reasons, reasons I couldn't even mention right now. Um, but to be able to have the conversations that I do now publicly, you have, and I, I, I could have never never imagined this ever in my entire life this is things like this don't just happen You're and the fact that i up, can man. tell you this <laughs> oh no <laughs> thank you just thank you thank you you got him <laughs> it's a pleasure it's a rough pleasure, but mm. I know. you know, did you knew what happened to me with uh, Marvel Comics? Yeah, that was something. It's really something to see yourself portrayed. You know, I got accused of being a Nazi pretty much when all this happened. It was really something because I had been teaching students. What we're talking about today, about these temptations that you faced and how people, you know, as individuals, get sucked into that totalitarian hell, you know, and then, so that was something for that to happen, such a reversal, and then to have that comic mm. book come out, well, it was surreal. It was absolutely mm. surreal to be portrayed, because <laughs> Nazi wasn't enough, right? We had to go right for the archetype itself. So I think we've raised about $400,000 for charity now on the basis mm -hmm. of that. So that was a fun reversal. But it was really shocking mm -hmm. when I first saw that. I, I just couldn't believe it. I was very ill at the time too. And 
I thought, this can't be real. This has to be Photoshop. This cannot possibly mm -hmm. be happening. It's so right. completely beyond comprehension. And, you know, to come from the pen of one of the foremost black intellectuals, and I, mm. I use the racial category only because that's the categories that he's using yes. to operate within. Yeah. You know, so. <sighs> so life is really weird. That, this is true. Right. This is right. true, as, as this whole conversation <laughs> illustrates. So, mm -hmm. so what have been the personal consequences for you of writing this letter and, and having it go? I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. have you have have you been pilloried? Has, have, what's what's happened to you? Um, I haven't, I haven't, I haven't received, and this this is something that I don't think about so much actually because I, I prefer to just allow it to be whatever it is right now to not expect it or to, it, it just is but I actually have not received any pushback from this and for it to have been read by over four million people and for me to not have been aggressively dragged through the streets of social media you know by my neck it's why not why hasn't it happened why do you think? What, what's what's operating to protect you? Do you think? You know what I. It would be very naive of me to think that my identity markers, the ones we've been speaking about, don't have anything to do with that. I think people are more willing to listen to what I'm saying because of the fact that I'm black. If I had been white, for example, a lot of what I'm saying, the more universal things that are not specific to me being black or Zimbabwean. Um, they would have just been dismissed because there are many things people have been saying over the past years that are just common sense. They make sense. People have genuine questions, but no one will listen to it because the first thing they will see is that you inhabit a white body, so you don't get to speak, you know? So I think people are more willing um, to hear what I have to say because of that. And I think it's also because... I'm not preaching to anyone. Mm -hmm, I'm not mm -hmm, telling mm -hmm, anyone what mm -hmm, to do. Yeah. That's a, yep, right? Yep, I'm, yep. right? I, I'm not an academic. I'm not trying to give you data. And this is not about that. This is a very personal account from someone that has been in it. I'm not righteous. I'm not above you or below you, right? This is just me mm -hmm. saying, hey, no, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm opting out of this game. And we all get to opt out, you know? And I, I, I think that's why it has been received very well because I'm speaking from the eye. I'm speaking from my own right, personal experience. Right. And I think it can be very hard to dispute that. Or well you can't well there, you see there's something interesting about that too, eh? Because one of the mantras of, of the left, I hate to use these categories, but we're we're stuck with it at the moment. Yes. Is, yes, yes. You know, the 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 uh implicit truth of subjectivity. And the thing Lived is there's the, yes right? but, and the thing is there's something right about that. Because mm -hmm. you are, there is a domain of knowledge that you have privileged access to that no one can dispute. And that domain of knowledge is your honest representation of your subjective experience. And that it does have the kind of power that you just described. Mm -hmm. And so there is, there's some sense in noting that as a form of truth. But then it, it the claim seems to have got twisted and perverted in some way, which, which is, it, it kind of gets elevated narcissistically. It's like, because I have this domain where I'm, I am the only person who has access to those experiences, then all of a sudden that gets in, it gets inflated in this political way into mm. a narcissistic claim that, you know, that means overall my truths are as good as any truth and they're as good as anyone else's. And there's an error there, right? Because there's, despite the fact that there are things that you can say that only you can say that no one can dispute, there are all sorts of things that you can't say that you don't know and that are absolutely subject to dispute. Yes. And so it's, it's, it's the, it's the narcissistic inflation of the claim beyond its reasonable boundaries. And then your conscience, I think was operating in you to say, well, where are the boundaries of this claim? Like the, mm. the, the let's take the war so to speak, between black people and the and police in the United States. 
Well, obviously that's a problem, but it's a really, really complex mm -hmm. problem. And maybe we want to have an instant solution to it, but we don't have an instant solution to it. And so mm -hmm. the claim is, well, this is a problem. And then the next claim is, well, it's based in racism. And then the next claim is it's based in white supremacy. It's like, well, wait a second. There's a problem here. And the problem with coming up with a solution so rapidly is, well, you don't know. You actually don't know. This is actually a really complicated problem. And your intuition that it's a problem is, is dead on. And your intuition that it would be reasonably more reasonable morally to be concerned about that is dead on. But the right approach is questioning, not answering. And I think part of the reason that I've got away with my lectures online, I think, maybe, and as a professor for that matter, is I do my best to always question. And even in my public lectures on the tour, I usually think of a question that I'm trying to answer. And then when I go out and lecture, I'm, I'm trying to explore the question. I'm not telling the audience yes. what they should think. I don't know what they should think. I don't even know what yes. I should think. And so I can guide them through the process of exploration. And, and that, oh. that seems to, well, so far that seems to be working. And that's what yes. we're doing in this conversation. And that's partly what right. makes it a good conversation, you know, is... We're trying to figure something out that we don't know. Mm, yes. Oh, I love that. I love that. And yeah, I, I think that directly speaks to um, why my letter has reached people in the way that it has. And it's, it's received such a positive reception, overwhelmingly so. I still receive hundreds of people messaging me every single day, emails, and it's, but you don't get the I, sickness from that that you got with that other. Oh, okay, no. so that's interesting too. So how do you know that yeah. this positive response is credible? Mm. Mm. Oh, that's a very good question. How do I know that this mm -hmm. positive response is credible? It's a knowing that I don't quite have language for. Because the, uh, another reality of this is that when you have so many eyes on you and you know that something like this is out there, there is a discomfort that comes with it. Um, but for me, that discomfort is adding to my well-being. It's not taken from my well-being. So it's very it's very difficult for me to sort of give a neat answer to that, but it's a it's a very deep knowing, and I'm sure you both know what I mean by that. And that when I receive messages from people in all corners of the world telling me that my letter has freed them, people sending me voice notes crying and saying that they you know they were ostracized by their family members for not supporting certain political movements last year or not making certain medical decisions that they don't think were the best ones to make, et cetera, et cetera. Because we're, we're in a time where I, in my lifetime anyway, we're more polarized than I've ever seen before. It's, it's so intense. Um, so the messages that I receive from real life people giving me specific accounts of what is happening in their lives and how coming across my words, words that I didn't even think were going to reach many people. Um, and that 4 million means something. And it's not just a, to me, it's not a vanity metric of saying 4 million people. I couldn't give a shit about anything like that. I really don't. It's about what that represents. When I have people, when I have other black people, telling me that I've given them some kind of permission slip to think dif differently, you know, because as black people, this is something that I have to be honest about, especially in the West, we're not afforded the same level of individuality as every everyone else. We're sort of placed in the oppressed category by default, you know, and it's almost like you have to fight for your individuality where you know, I say this in my letter, but Black people and so are what's, not a what, what's the weight for what is the weight of that? So, I mean, hypothetically, right? Hy the, the theory is, mm. well, we're trying to help mm. you by defining you as oppressed. Right. I mean, th that's the theory, because we see that, well, th even if you use racial metrics, for example, there's inequality. And, and yeah. so the inequality is directed at you as a racial group. So th the first thing you have to swallow is that you should be referred to primarily by your racial group, right? To, right. to be the beneficiary of that victim status. So that's mm. something very insidious. It's very insidious. But, but 
we can give the devil his due and say, well, there's some genuine concern there too. But Michaela mentioned earlier how she felt when she was placed in the oppressed category, you know, briefly yeah. in a science class. And it's like you just said that you're in some sense burdened with that, struggling with that all the mm. time. What's the cost of that? Or is that what we're talking about continually in this that, conversation? That, that's, that, that is what we're talking about. That is what we're talking about. And again, I, I see all of these conversations quite differently because... I wasn't born and raised here in the Western world. So I have, I, I do have something else to compare it to. And of course, because of my geographical location, being in Zimbabwe, being in Africa, where everyone around me is the same. I, I, I always say I, I found out that I was actually black when I was nine years old, when I came here. I didn't know that before. I didn't have to think about that. I, I, why would I have had to think about that? Now suddenly I'm hearing black, 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 you're black, you're this. Oh, you you like, you know, Motley Crue, but you're black. Black people don't like that. Or you... Do you right? like Led so Zeppelin? It's, it's, right, I love Led Zeppelin. Oh, yeah, well, should I? Yeah. Should I listen to <laughs> Definitely not. Secrets? Definitely. Yes, definitely. Yes, <laughs> definitely. Right, so now mm -hmm. there are suddenly all of these... Pre, like this list of things that I should and shouldn't like, but they're attached to my skin color. So to me, a lot of this has always just been extremely bizarre. So I've never over identified with any of those labels. I do understand their importance. I really do. I really, really do. Um, and I, I do know that because of those identity markers, I'm treated in a certain way, et cetera, et cetera. But I don't over identify with them in the way that some people wish I did which I think was the issue of everything that I've been experiencing. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think I just view a lot of this very differently because culturally it, it just doesn't make sense for me to make my quote unquote blackness the entirety of who I am. It, it, it just, it, it it doesn't, it doesn't fit. It doesn't make well, sense. Well, it's certainly not an accomplishment of yours. Right. Right. I mean, it's not associated with anything you've done, good or bad, <laughs> as an active agent. And so it's, 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 it's hard for me to see the advantage of that kind of identification. It, yeah. And easy for me to see the disadvantages. Yeah. So. Right. Okay, guys, we have to call it quits. That was an absolute honor to host both of you. I am so happy that we all got to do this. Uh, before we go, Africa, could you tell people if they don't follow you where they could go to follow you, where you are online? Of course. So my only social media at this moment in time is Instagram. You can find me at Africa Brooke with an E at the end. I have a lot of live conversations there. I do a lot of live podcasting. I'm, I'm just a curious person. And I, I allow myself to do that publicly with all of you. So you can join me there. If you want to find out more about my work, my website is africabrook.com. Thanks, guys. That was, that was really cool. It was a pleasure Thank meeting you, so you and talking to you. Very nice to meet you. And you too, Jordan. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um,